Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody, and we certainly join. I want to encourage those who are joining us by live stream from home. We thank you for your involvement and presence uh, with us as well. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, as they say, and uh, it's good for us to be here uh, together in order that we might exalt God and encourage one another. And it's always uh, a pleasure for those of us who have the privilege of coming up here to look out and have the best seat in the house to see everyone's shining faces. And it's such a, a thrill and an encouragement and strength to me to be able to look from this place each week and see all of you. So thank you so much for who you are, for what you're striving to do and be. And I'm grateful for the grace of God that's evident in the lives of so many. Well, I sometimes talk about uh, my grandparents quite a bit. My grandfather, in particular, on my mother's side, I called him Papa. He was uh, a wonderful, wonderful man. And he grew up during the Great Depression era, or didn't grow up, he lived through the Great Depression era in northwestern uh, Oklahoma, where they also experienced uh, the Dust Bowls. And um, when I think of that era and the stories that my papa would tell about what it was like living through that experience, I'm always reminded of some of these iconic pictures of that from that particular era and the weathered and hardened look uh, on people's faces as they endured such material hardships that most of us who've grown up in times like I have can hardly even imagine, but it's not that far removed. I mean, this was the world in which my grandfather lived, and he was an extraordinarily resourceful person. He could do more with, with less than just about anybody that I know. Maybe, maybe uh, Chase and Sam are uh, after uh, his likeness in that regard. They uh, just resourceful, can, can find a way to make use of anything. A story that I love to tell is, is growing up, my, my granddad took an old Maytag washing machine engine. Yes, they were made, they were gasoline powered washing machines. A uh, single cylinder engine, and, and he took it and made a wooden frame around it and turned it into a go kart that us grandkids would ride around and steer with our feet. And uh, he was like that. He could do anything, was very mechanically gifted uh, and uh, uh, resourceful in, in so many, many ways. And he, he said uh, an expression that stuck with me, and I think it was something that was developed during the Depression era. Uh, he talked about when things got tough, you just have to grab a root and growl. I don't know exactly what that means, but I sort of get the idea of this dust bowl just blowing through and there's, 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 it's just absolutely barren. And the only thing that's just going to keep you from being blown off the prairie is if you find some knobby root growing out of the ground and you grab hold of that and you just growl and you hold on for dear life. It's tenacity. It's the determination not to give up no matter how, how hard or difficult things become. And people of that generation who, who thrived and survived through it understood that concept. When I got a little bit older, I began to notice that my papa's family was, was always around. There were family reunions on his side of the family. And I knew my great-grandmother, his mother, and, and, and lots of his uh, brothers and sisters. And we would get together. And it was always a, a wonderful experience as a kid growing up being around that. Uh, but I, at some point, realized that I never saw any of my, my grandmother's family. They were never around. I and mean, when they didn't have family reunions, and I didn't hear stories about them. And I remember asking on one occasion, what, what was up with that? And my grandmother herself said, well, they all took to drinking and died. That was basically her explanation of her side of the family. They all took to drinking and died. And so we didn't spend time around them because rather than grabbing a root and growl, they had grabbed a bottle and not developed the tenacity and the strength of character that they needed in order to get through those difficult times. And I think about that today because not that our material situation is like theirs. We have had such uh, improvement dramatically, and not just here in the United States, but globally, the economic and material circumstances of people's lives have just been changed in almost a miraculous way. 
uh, poverty uh, is disappearing in terms of absolute poverty and famine and starvation is so much less of a problem today than it has ever been in the past. And there are so many, again, measurable standards that we can look at and see that people's lives are getting better. Life expectancy has grown in dramatic ways, especially in third world countries. But unfortunately, our, our, our social, spiritual, and psychological and moral health has not kept pace with our material progress. And one of the pictures that we might could look at today that would sort of encapsulate what so many young people especially are experiencing in contrast to the depression era is something like this where there's great amount of material prosperity but there is emotional and spiritual despair. A lack of any real social connection a, a, a failure of holding on to religious values. And this is being recognized by people, um, academics and clinicians at the highest level describe a meaning, <clears throat> a word, the, the word that they use is a meaning crisis. A meaning crisis that has gripped the modern world where people have so much but it means so little. And and there's no map or context in which to understand all of the prosperity that we are experiencing. And I think that we are entering into a period of, of history. I'm certainly no prophet, but as I look around at the situation that we are facing societally, I don't expect that problem to get a whole lot better real soon. In fact, it may get much worse before it gets better. But the good news is, that we can strive heroically through the worst of times, no matter how difficult it gets, if we will commit ourselves to the things that make us stronger, the things like family and our faith in God and in the transcendent values that are revealed to us in His Word, and if we stick together with other people of good faith, then there really is nothing that we cannot persevere through if we'll just grab the roots that are available to us and growl and not let go. But on the other hand, if we do not do that and instead begin to make the mistakes and do the things that weaken us, so that we do not develop the strength of character that we need to persevere through what may lie ahead, then we will not prevail. So we must do the things that make us stronger and avoid the things that make us weaker. And one thing that will decrease our ability to deal with life's burdens, whether material or emotional or spiritual or otherwise, is, and that will certainly add needless suffering into our lives is drug use and alcohol abuse. Those are things that are not gonna make anyone stronger, anyone more resilient, anyone better equipped to deal with the personal struggles and traumas that life brings our way or the societal difficulties that confront us on a national and worldwide level. And so considering the situation, we want to talk a little bit about uh, what the Bible has to say about such things. The Bible, I do not believe, is an uh, abolitionist or a teetotaling type of document. I don't think that that case can be successfully made personally. However, Scripture does give us warnings about the abuse and misuse and the danger of intoxicants. And it does so in strong and vivid terminology. The book of Proverbs, perhaps singularly, uh, has a negative uh, position toward uh, the general use uh, of alcohol and certainly of drunkenness in particular. And when we think about the way that the book of Proverbs is written, it's written from the standpoint of a father to his son, of a king to his future princes, those who would have positions of authority and significance in society. And he wants to urge his sons, these young men, to, to develop the strength of character, the wisdom and the insight that they need in order to be able to take their place as they come to adulthood successfully. 
And he recognizes the negative impact as he had no doubt seen it firsthand being in a position where that kind of thing was readily available to, to a wealthy ancient ruler and seen the negative consequences of it, he strongly urges young men in particular to avoid its use. He says in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1 that wine is a mocker and beer is a brawler, taking and transferring the, uh, the uh, effect that the substance has uh, on the person and transferring it to the substance itself. He says that the idea being that wine makes a mockery of men. It makes them both those who mock at things that are admirable and valuable and meaningful, and it also turns them into a contemptible and, 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 and uh, uh, someone to be made fun of themselves. And a brawler, he says, and I'll mention a little bit later, it is uh, amazing when you look at the st- statistics, the connections that, are, uh, that, that exist between um, physical violence in America and the use of, of alcohol. And those, he says, therefore, who are led astray by them are not wise. This will not make you stronger. This will not equip you for whatever challenges lie ahead in your life personally or what we face as a nation. Giving oneself over to the use of alcohol will not set you up to succeed moving forward. Perhaps the most protracted statement in all the Bible uh, about this is found also in the book of Proverbs in verse 23. In a poetic description, he says, sort of in riddle-like setup, who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who is always fighting? Who is always complaining? Who is always suffering unnecessary bruises and bloodshot eyes? I think this is the NLT, and I chose it because of the way that it it phrases this. I love the way he says, unnecessary bruises. And the point of this is, and, and what I was trying to accomplish in that introductory section, is that life is hard. And, and as we go through life, every phase has its unique challenges. But the baseline reality of, of life in this fallen world is that it confronts all of us uh, on uh, a level that rocks us to our core. It's, it's hard to persevere. It's hard to grab hold of a root and growl. And yet, some people make the choice of of adding to all of the burdens and difficulties and challenges of life the unnecessary bruises, the unnecessary batterings, the unnecessary conflicts that are a result of having given oneself over to the use and abuse of alcohol. And so he asks the question, who is this? And he says, it is the one who spends long hours in the taverns, hanging out at the bar, trying out new drinks, you got to try this. Have you tried that? Have you ever used this? And then he adds this admonition. Don't, don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles and swirls in the cup. Yeah, it has uh, its level of appeal or how smoothly it, it tastes as it goes down. But instead, he says, notice what the effects of it are what the long-term outcome of it is. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. It stings like a viper. And you will see hallucinations and you will say crazy things. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, clinging to a swaying mask, mast. Like the whole world is becoming unstable. And if sometimes it feels like the world we're living in now is becoming unstable, the last thing we need to do is consume things that increase the instability and dull our senses to the sobering realities that we need in order to navigate through life's difficult and perilous ways. And he says, at last you will say, they hit me and I didn't feel it. I was numb to the negative effects of what was happening to me. The alcohol did something to cause me not to notice how destructive it was being in my life. I didn't even know it, he says, when they beat me up. But then he asks, 
Not when will I can I sober up so that I have learned life's lesson, but when can I wake up so that I can look for another drink? And so this speaks to the fact that not only does alcohol expose us to unnecessary suffering and weaken our ability to cope with the challenges and difficulties that life presents us, but it also has the tendency to grow addictive. That the person who has experienced all of this still simply seeks the next opportunity to numb himself once more from the pain of life by pursuing another drink, knowing that it has such devastating and ill effects on him. The Bible also not only warns us of the danger of intoxication, but it clearly defines drunkenness as a sin, as as missing what God has in mind for us as his people. He says in Romans chapter 13, verse 13, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality. In other words, among various sins, including sexual sins and sensual, uh, giving ourselves over to sensuality, he addresses drunkenness uh, in the middle of that as something that is not proper for the children of light. For people who are trying to live in the light and live in a, a life that is pleasing to God, and maybe living a life that's actually useful and helpful to other people around you, rather than being something that is taking away from them, conduct yourself soberly and not in drunkenness. He adds in Galatians 5, this classic passage on the contrast between the fruit of the Spirit of God at work in our lives with the works of the flesh, the cravings that come from within. And he tells us, that, tells us that the works of the flesh are obvious. They include sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, and carousing, the, the drinking parties, the wild party atmosphere and scenes that's so prevalent on college campuses, for instance. These kinds of things, he says, I want, to, I want you to know, and I've told you before, and I'm telling you again, that those who practice such things, if, if that becomes your way of life, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't participate in what God's trying to accomplish in the world for good. If this list, including drunkenness, is what characterizes your way of life, you know, we all recognize there's good and evil and there's the heroic and there's the destructive, the villain. And we need to recognize that this is a part of that picture. And choosing to go down a path of life that puts us in this category is not, is not appealing ultimately on any level if we'll step back and be honest with ourselves and what we're experiencing. And those who have had I don't know whether to say the fortunate or the unfortunate circumstances of growing up in households with a mom who was an addict or a dad who was a drunkard, who have had siblings whose lives have been damaged in terrible ways. My own brother has suffered and done wrong as a consequence of an addiction to alcohol that he developed when he was in high school and college, by just having fun, not knowing that this was going to have this addictive effect on his life that would stay with him for decades. I wanna just say I'm so proud of of him and grateful for God's grace that has worked in his life and he's, I think now, about six years sober. But it's been a a horrible battle, and it's a terrible thing. And anyone who has had that experience of a loved one or someone in their life who's who's walked through that knows what it's it's like, and that it's not it's not conducive to life in God's kingdom, what God wants for you, and the good that He has in mind for all of His creation. 1 Peter 4 and verse 3 says much the same thing about the sinfulness of of drunkenness. And so Christians are urged, even when 
we have our liberties, to be very careful in the exercise of those liberties that we do not cause a brother or sister to stumble or to fall. And that's in Romans 14, verse 21. Drunkenness disqualifies a man from serving as an elder. An overseer, he says, among other things, must be not addicted to wine. And deacons are also told in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8 that they must not be addicted to much wine. And so these warnings should not be downplayed. But rather, I'm sorry, but rather they should be amplified. These these warnings should not be downplayed, but rather they should be amplified today in our context for at least two reasons. In other words, we need to give even more careful attention to these warnings today than, than they did back then for these two reasons. Number one, because of the intoxicating power of most modern beverages is significantly greater than those in the ancient world. They didn't have the hard distilled liquors that are so common today, whiskey and vodka and rum, and and I don't even want to go into all that because I don't know enough about all of that to to give much of a definitive explanation of it. But, But these drinks that contain extremely high concentrations of alcohol was not a technology that they possessed at this time. And then even the modern table wines that are uh, available to us today are much more potent on average than the table wines that were in use in biblical times. For example, ancient wines generally contained, we're told, about 5 to 8% alcohol by volume. In the naturally fermenting processes and the, um, uh, the chemical agents that they had available to them, that that was basically what would, uh, w- would, would max out, maybe as high on some uh, instances as 10%. And we also know that it was a frequent practice for them to dilute that by cutting it with, with water. But today's alcohols, or today's wines rather, table wines, are often between 12 and 18 percent of alcohol by volume, which means that two to three times of the potency of those wines that Solomon was warning the young man and young woman against in Proverbs. And so what that simply means is that a person with drinking only a half or a third as much could achieve the same level of intoxication that someone would back then. Therefore, we need to be more alert and more aware of the threat and the danger that alcohol today poses than it did even for them. And if they had those kinds of warnings then, how much more seriously should we take it today? And the second thing that I would say about that is that we need to be more careful because of the Uh, widespread availability of alcohol in large quantities to virtually everyone. Now, I'm not saying that everyone didn't have access to it in the ancient world, but as resources are so cheap for us today, uh, in comparison to the average poor person in the ancient world, for them to have regularly gotten enough undiluted wine to, uh, to become intoxicated on it on a consistent basis would perhaps be something that would have been very difficult for an average or poor person to have done in those times. Whereas today, one of the characteristics of poverty is a higher rate of alcohol use and abuse. And so let's not be smug, but let us give more earnest attention to the warnings that are contained in Scripture on on this topic. Now, God doesn't warn us about all of this because he is a killjoy, but because he wants us to have real joy. He wants us to have real peace and, and happiness, the kind that he gives and not the kind that is found in a bottle that runs out and leaves us more empty than we were before. God recognizes our tendency to be reckless 
and especially when we are young. Alcohol takes away our fear of the consequences. It doesn't take away our realization that a a particular act could be risky or dangerous. It just makes us not care that it's risky or dangerous. And because, again, young people tend to be a little bit riskier and more dangerous to begin with, taking away what inhibitions you already have exposes you to a much greater likelihood of danger. There's an extremely high relationship, as I mentioned earlier, between sexual assaults, murders, fights that have to have the cops involved to break it up, and alcohol. I didn't ask them beforehand, but I'm sure that those in our membership who are involved in law enforcement would be able to echo that, and I'm sure would be more than happy to address any young people who have questions about the connection between these kinds of violent events and the use of alcohol. And so young people, my appeal to you this morning is to care enough, to care enough about yourself, to care enough about your future, to care enough about the people who have invested so much in your lives already, to care enough about the future people who are going to be a part of your life, to invo- avoid the entanglements of something that will, has the potential to wreck your life. Find a root to grab hold of and growl. Find a way to make yourself stronger, to improve yourself, to improve your position, to improve your ability to strive morally, your ability to connect with God spiritually, your ability to relate to other people personally. These are the skills and the strengths that enable a person to get through difficult seasons of life which you will inevitably face. Whereas if you condition yourself to cope with struggles and difficulties by numbing yourself in the present in order to just get through the moment, you will gradually become weaker and weaker and less able to connect with God, with people, or with yourself in a constructive way. And who knows what lies ahead for you personally or for us as a society And so the thing to do is to commit yourself now to position yourself in a way that gives you every advantage to be good for yourself and good for others and good for God in the days that lie ahead. And then secondly, God not only knows that our tendency is toward being reckless and therefore urges us to avoid the misuse of alcohol, but also our tendency to become dependent upon it. Often those who become dependent on it began as simply recreational users. But for some people, alcohol provides a significant and even dramatic temporary relief from negative emotional states. It relieves anxieties and diminishes fears and social fears. A lot of people speak of how it gives them confidence around others. And the scary thing is that there is a correlation between those positive perceived benefits and the likelihood that it will become an addiction for you. In other words, the better it makes you feel in the moment, the more likely you are to begin to return to it in a manner that becomes a dependency. And when it becomes a dependency, it is terrible on your health. You begin to do stupid things under its influence. You make life hell for the people who are around you, and it tends to make you a liar. And you will miss out on countless opportunities that God would desire to give you. 
God doesn't want you to miss out on the best things in life. And so he warns us about the things that can steal that from us and steal it from others. And so God wants us to learn how to deal with our anxieties and with our fears and with the struggles that we are perhaps facing with a meaning crisis as a society by building relationships with people who truly have your best interest at heart, people who love you, not people who just want to get high with you, people who just want to have a good time with you, like the prodigal son who went off into a foreign land and wasted his inheritance on wine, women, and song because as soon as the inheritance was gone, so were the friends. And I've known countless people who became involved in this sort of lifestyle and were surrounded by friends and those friends disappeared the moment that they were in need. Those aren't friends. Friends are the people who make you better. Friends are the people who provide that upward pressure on you to become more than you are today. And not those who are trying to drag you down to the lowest common denominator. And so strengthen yourself by having associations and friendships with people who love you and who care about you and who will be with you through thick and thin. That's, that's the way you deal with the problems that you're facing is by connection and deeper connection with people who care. And you build moral and emotional and cognitive strength by applying yourself in life and doing the best that you can with the opportunities that are before you, not by wasting yourself and looking for opportunities to get wasted and become, and to, and to therefore waste your life. Finally, and most importantly, God wants us to deal with our anxieties and our fears and our desire for states of euphoria, for that matter, by learning to turn to Him and being embraced by His love and being the recipient of His grace and be reminded of what He tells us about us being created in His image and in His likeness for fellowship with Him both now and for eternity, that that's what God wants for you and He wants for all of us. And that He's made forgiveness of our sins, every sin possible. And those of you who have sinned in this way and who struggle with this, that grace is there for you. This is not a message that is intended to condemn anyone except those who would remain in an, in an impenitent and hardened position. But to those who are striving, turn to the grace and the goodness and the love of God. He is for you and not against you. And he wants to pull you from where you are and from what maybe has held you captive and held you back and held you down for far too long and lift you up to a new and better place and set you on a solid foundation and we can learn the habit of going to God in prayer and feeding on his word and fellowshipping with other believers in such a way that we come closer to God and we find that strength and we find the joy and the peace and the confidence. Who, who cares what everybody thinks about you as long as you know that you have God's approval I'm right with God. I'm right with good people who care about me. I'm not going to allow myself to be overly anxious and overly wrought and overly concerned about what other people are thinking or doing. And I find my strength and my joy and my happiness through that connection with God. And I will not turn from him to something else to make me feel better for the moment, but only actually steals tomorrow's joy by dragging it into pre to the present so that tomorrow I have to drink a little bit more to numb the pain. God's a pain taker. Jesus is a pain taker. He bore the cross and bore the pain, bore the agony of all of our sins and all of our failures and all of our shame heaped upon him so that ours could be taken away. Are you ready this morning to transfer 
your dependence and your hope and your trust from whatever else has been the idol that has gripped your heart and your life and put your confidence and hope and trust in Him. And find in Him the joy and relief that your heart longs for. And we would encourage you to confess His name this morning as Lord and Savior, to be immersed with Him in the waters of baptism so that you can begin to experience the power of His Holy Spirit living within you. And that's so important because it says in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, that we are, as John read this morning at the beginning of, of the lesson, that we are, we are not to be drunk with wine, but to be what? Filled with God's Spirit. If you're ready to have Christ in your life, the Spirit being the animating force within you, and put away other animating spirits in order that you can rely on the Spirit of God, then we want to encourage you to come and we'll help you in any way that we can while we stand and while we sing.